<laughs> well, whether boss heroes, you are an uh, early to bed or early to rise or neither, we're glad you're here. And this week, um, I want to share with you uh, some things that have been on my radar for a while and that I am kind of starting to work into some new content that I'm writing. A bit Full disclosure, I'm in the very early stages of gathering research and data for my next book. I'm not here to announce Ooh. the next book. Um, I Darn. don't know when the next book will be, but uh, I know that I want the next book to be the best thing I've ever done. And so I've slowed down the process even more. And I'm very much in the research phase. And the cool thing about having a podcast is when you encounter research, you can pull some of that data and information and talk about it in this sort of forum. Um, and one of the things that uh, is sort of showing up heavily in my research is that we are hiring the wrong bosses. We mm -hmm. consistently pick the wrong people or underprepared people for leadership roles. So here are a couple of things, uh, and, and some of this data has been out for a little while, the past two or so years, and you may have seen it if you if you spend a lot of time on LinkedIn or you read lots of, of business magazines, you may have seen some of this. Here's the first startling stat. Only one in 10 people possess the necessary traits that great managers exhibit. One out of 10. This is from research right. that was published in September 2020 by McKinsey about the roles that bosses play in making workplaces uh, better for employees. In that uh, same report, they said that 75% of employees report that the most stressful aspect of their job is their immediate boss. Mm -hmm. We also know, this is another stunning stat. Uh, this is from another consulting group called Culture Smith in a white paper they, were, they published a few years ago. Most leaders, a majority of leaders, so they don't give me the number, but a majority meaning above 50%, spend as long as 10 years in a management role before receiving any kind of direct leadership training. Yikes. Yeah, that's a, you made a face for folks watching on YouTube. And yes, that's the <laughs> face. 60% um, of new leaders promoted or hired within our current modern era fail within their first year on the job. Mm. We also know that the manager on a team, the manager alone accounts for 70% of the variance in that team's employee engagement. That's from uh, a book published by Gallup called It's the Manager by Clifton and Harder, which has a ton of data in it about this sort of thing. So there's a there's a pattern we see over and over again in research that we are mm -hmm. not good at picking the right people. I, I As I've gathered this together, I, I keep having a single idea that's bouncing around in my head, and that is this. Literally, a dartboard and a blindfold <laughs> would produce about the same results that we're getting when it comes to who we select to manage people. And that's terrifying, isn't it? It's terrifying. And maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it's hitting me in a way that's like startling of self. Meaning if it's only one in 10 that possess the traits, how do I know that I'm the one? that has the traits or there's a nine out of 10 chance I'm not <laughs> right and like what do I do about that because first and foremost I want to make sure that I'm the right person mm -hmm. and then maybe I'll be a little better at picking the right people to serve as my mid-level managers and all of the rest of those things. But for me, it's like instantaneous self-inventory. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh crap, oh crap. I, and, and then maybe if like, if I think maybe, oh, well, I'm definitely, I'm definitely, then I think, oh, well, then I got too much of a problem because I, I'm definitely not if I think I am. <laughs> Maybe it's right. Too much. It's a vicious cycle. But I think most of the folks listening to this podcast would immediately raise their hand and say, oh, I'm absolutely part of the nine out of 10. When I was hired, I didn't exhibit the characteristics to be great on day one. 
Uh, you know, I, I think most leaders would say it was baptism by fire. I had to figure mm-hmm. it out. I had to fail a lot. Uh, I, I have said to many audiences that it, over my career, I see leaders heading down one of three paths when they get hired into a management role and they figure out that, as the, as the famous book title says, what got me here won't get me there, mm-hmm. uh, th- that when... I figure out that this job as a leader requires a whole set of people skills that I've not been given and do not currently possess. One of three things happens. First, some managers say, I don't want to do that kind of work, and they bail out. And that's fine. That's yeah. that, that's probably a good decision if they're self-aware enough to know that they don't want to do it. Uh, the second thing that happens is they go, Okay, well, I've got some learning to do. And they move towards leadership development. They say, what do I need to know and learn and practice in order to be successful leading people? Right. And then the third option is they embrace the technical management aspects of the role only. They kind of hole up in their office and they worry about the reports and the data and the schedules and the kind of technical, tactile parts of leading, and they ignore the people. And then that's where we see a lot of harm taking place and when people say, yeah, I work for a bad boss. Yeah. They become the problem solver in chief, and that is it, right? That is, I mean, obviously it's a lot because you can solve a lot of problems, but that whole actual leading of the people thing. Um, And the other thing that I think I would add to that second avenue that you spoke of, which is this, you know, the leadership development track where they are going to learn. There's no end point to that. At no point in our career should we go, okay, well now with, you know, 20 some years of experience managing, I have arrived. There's, this is what I, this is what I know now, and thus I will commence just it bestowing my knowledge and not learning anything more. Yes. I mean, and we're not consciously saying that, but probably by some of the unconscious things that we're saying or doing, or maybe some of our actions, that's what's speaking to others about us. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think this continual earnestness um and curiosity about ourselves and earnestness of wanting that to learn about other people and continuing to evolve um, the opportunities for our own self-development is really an imperative. And you just landed on the really kind of the first ingredient that we think we need in order to pick the right people, right? And in order okay. to, to find yeah. the right manner. So, so I'm not here to proclaim that okay, I, I am here to proclaim that we are not, hiring the right people for leadership roles or when we hire people we are not adequately supporting them in the role i will proclaim that the data is clear on that i am not here to proclaim that i know how to fix that yet (laughs) see the new book down the line because i think that's (laughs) going to be a big part of it where that's some of the work that that i'm trying to do on this but we know about some things that probably need to be involved in the conversation and so i thought we could talk about a couple of those and you just hit on one of them which is this continuous learning element and there are a couple of angles to it the first angle of course is we have to be giving people some skills and some training and some insight before they step into the role immediately after they step into the role and throughout their time in the role. We know that leaders only develop through continuous, ongoing coaching, mentoring, training, and support. The other part of that in terms of continuous learning is we know that leaders tend to be more successful when they are a part of a peer group of other leaders. This is some research that Gallup has done. It's actually out of that book I mentioned a few minutes ago called It's the Manager. They have seen in the data a pattern of higher levels of performance on teams from leaders, from managers, who are a part of another of a, of a group of managers that are working together to develop and grow and share insight and support each other. So if you're a leader and you're on an island and you don't have that kind of peer group, the evidence suggests you could be le- uh, less effective than someone who does. And so there's this idea that we're constantly functioning as a student, mm. right? That, that, that as a leader, um, 
I am constantly consuming, and that's the other angle of this, um, insight and ideas for how to be better at the people side of what I do. This very podcast exists for that reason and for those people, right? This podcast isn't for someone who says, I've got the boss thing down and I know all I need to know. Hmm. Yep. So that continuous learning piece seems to be one such ingredient. You know what this reminds me of um, is this exercise that I have found really beneficial with some of my coaching clients, which is I ask them to build their best boss. Like if they could take mm. pieces of what they have experienced in the past um, and build the best boss, what would that person say? Mm -hmm. How would they act? How would they make you feel? Right? By being able to kind of draw upon the past experiences and future experiences that they hope to have in either a coaching dynamic or a mentoring um, dynamic, that gives some framework for the aspects of self-development of introspection of specific training and things that interest them that they believe are most important to mm -hmm. leadership development it's like i gave you the roadmap for this conversation ahead of time because you nailed the <laughs> second ingredient um, oh yay that, that's really funny because we did you know, we, we, Alyssa and i kind of have a rule that we don't talk about the topics until we hit record so that it can really be sort of an organic discussion um that's where it's gold jerry it's gold um <laughs> that's a seinfeld reference i don't know if you know that because that's a that, you don't watch tv um <laughs> But, I do. Okay. Good um, TV, not your definition of good TV. Oh, listen, Seinfeld was made as the greatest television sitcom in the history of television. I don't disagree. I agree that it was, but I just don't watch it regularly. I, I, I haven't watched it in a long time either. But we digress. Okay, so this other piece that you alluded to. We know that studies on servant leadership, the, the idea that my job as a leader is to make my employees' lives easier, physically, mm -hmm. cognitively, emotionally. My job is to figure out what these people need to be at their best every day and, and give it to them, to create those conditions for them to thrive. This idea as the center role of the leader has some merit to it in terms of producing engagement and having people be successful in that role. And so, this is a shift that a lot of organizations, I think, are, I know, are starting to embrace, which is shifting the role from manager to coach. Mm -hmm. So if my job is to go to work every day and interact and float and coach and assess and challenge and push and respond and communicate and solicit ideas and bring people together and, and position them to be at their best every day, to foster belonging, to, to figure out the resources that they need and advocate for them. I'm creating an environment for people to thrive. And so that mm -hmm. kind of a shift in defining what the role is, is also crucial to helping bosses be successful. When we hire leaders and we tell them your number one job is to drive revenue, right, or customer acquisition as a leader, well, guess what? You will acquire more customers when they interact with your personnel who are so engaged that they can't help but want to go there and no place else. And that comes from the boss. Yeah. And so there's there's a shift. That's the 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 second such ingredient that we think we know about. That's a phenomenal I mean the that in and of itself explains why we are hiring the wrong people mm -hmm. because we have the wrong thing as a target right yep. if we change the target if we acknowledge really the, truly the essence of what we want in that role we can hire the right people the right bosses there are some other traits we, we we've talked a lot about um curiosity on this show and you know 
that's probably going to occupy a little chunk of the next book too, about that being perhaps one of the most important traits that leaders possess. Um, there's a certain amount of emotional intelligence that leaders need to possess in order to be successful. Um, and so I think there is some interesting work that is being done in and around that angle for, for how do we predict the success of a leader based on some of those traits? And how do you, how do you measure those? And how do you find those in the selection process? Too mm-hmm. often, we know that we hire and promote leaders based on technical expertise, or industry knowledge, and then they get into the role, and what they need to be successful isn't technical expertise or industry knowledge. Certainly, it serves them well, and and in some degree with people, it gives them credibility. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't position them to do any of the things we just talked about. And so if, if we aren't recalibrating for leaders... Yes, you have these things operating in the background, that technical expertise and that, those years of experience, but you're not going to have influence because of those things. You're not going to be able to move people to action because of those things. They're just going to listen to you for the first five minutes because of those things. Everything that comes after is about not. all this other stuff. Yep. Yeah. Credibility is not a motivator for oper- oper- operating or um, inducing people to commit to you. Yes. I think there's a, a I'm going to use this really horrible, overused, buzzwordy phrase. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm bracing myself. I think there's a paradigm shift coming. <laughs> Oh, oh Lord. Ooh. Just just giving that a ding because I want to acknowledge that that's a that's a oh man, that's a that's corporate speak right there. That's MBA buzzword yeah. stuff. <laughs> but there I think there is a paradigm shift coming in how we evaluate and select leaders. And it's going to be data driven because most of this this data that we're seeing about about what people need from their bosses to be successful, uh, the emotional and psychological buttons and levers they need to push and pull in order to get the mm-hmm. most out of people. Uh, and the way that we've been picking bosses to date doesn't work. And so we are looking at that data and saying, well, why don't we just do it differently and see what happens? And that goes back to the blindfold and the dartboard, right? Because mm-hmm. no matter what you try differently, I would argue there's potentially a chance you're going to get better results (laughs) if the data is to be believed. Don't lose hope, folks. You'll find all the answers you need in Joe's next book. Just (laughs) just which only exists as a loose collection of ideas. So (laughs) see me in a year and a half. Yes. And we'd like to apologize to to anybody who maybe feels like we just said you were not the right boss to be hired, because (laughs) if you've put yourself through the work to acquire the skills and the values yes. and the insights needed to meet people where they are and to create the conditions for them to thrive, then you are a boss hero and you deserve to be right where you are. That's right. Don't lose hope. You are the hope. 